Well, there's a gentleman that deserves the Nobel Prize, or a prize of some sort, Anthony Watts, who's a, a, an amateur, he's not an amateur, he's a, he's a weather forecaster in the States, and he looked at this, these 1,200 dots here, which are the weather stations across the States, and he, he remembered this photo he had, grandma gave him when he was young, and this is what some of these weather stations look like. And he thought, well, you know, I wonder what they look like. So he got a team of people together that go around, and the um, red spots here are the stations they've surveyed. And all this data is averaged into this US temperature curve for the last 120 years or something. Then that is one of the inputs into this global curve, which Chris has already shown you, increases up to 1940, decreases down to 1979, and increases again. So the basic data for this is coming from here. The US has the best climate observing stations in the world. Everybody agrees. This is the blue chip data set. So Anthony Watts had a look at this, and this is what he found. The Global Observing Network, the heart and soul of the surface weather measurement, is a disaster. Urbanisations place many sites on hot black asphalt next to trash barrels beside heat exhaust fat and even attached to hot chimneys and I think that means barbecues. This is American, remember? <laughs> well, there you go. I'm making it up. Watts is making it up. No, we're not. Here's a typical station. Furthermore, this is the University of Arizona, a pedigree institution maintained by the professionals. Here it is. Here's the official, tells you, official station. Sitting on Asheville. <laughs> Recently, they replaced the thermometer which was inside the Stevenson box with a more modern aspirated temperature sensor. That's mounted at the wrong height above the ground. It's 1.5 feet below the standard measuring level. I say again, this is a US government established pedigree site. Here's the curve, temperature curve, and you see it goes up here. Anyone want to guess when this uh, change was made? There it is, 2001. <laughs> you think that's bad? Look at this. These sensors were on top of the building to which these air conditioners are attached, and they were moved down to the ground a few years ago and they're now right next to the exhaust fans of these air conditions. Here's the... You want to guess when that happened? <laughs> well, not only did it happen then, but it turns out that you're right to guess it happened then, but you're wrong to think that was what the cause was. Because the analysis of the data showed that most of the warming was in winter of this step here, and the air conditions weren't turned on. That's a big problem. Giant problem. So when you have a giant problem, you call in a giant to deal with it. Here he is. His name's Steve McIntyre. He's the dragon slayer of this nonsensical piece of propaganda called the hockey stick. Most people, having slain that giant and absorbed the amount of abuse he did over that, would have retired. Not Steve McIntyre. He had to think about that. Sorry. He had to think about this up here. And he went back and looked at the data, which is always a good thing to do, and he discovered that at that time, because of preparation for the year 2000 computer scare, NASA, just by mistake, it wasn't sinister, restored, after they corrected their software for Y2K, they restored the wrong data stream, the raw data stream rather than the process data stream, not only for this station, but for a number of other stations in the US network. Torpedo number six, and it's a big one. Here was the previous reconstruction of the US temperatures, and five out of the, the top ten temperatures in the last hundred years fell up here, with this one, 1995, being the warmest ever. When you correct for these mistakes, which uh, NASA have now done, you take 0.15 degrees centigrade off most of... Oh, God, I'm too apologise for this. You take 1.5 degrees centigrade off, off most of this part of the graph, you reduce it down here, and now the cluster of hot... Um, years is in the 1930s, not at the end of the 20th century at all. <coughs> it's pretty embarrassing stuff. Okay, here's our temperature curve again. Um, warming to 1940, cooling, warming. And the question is, is this warming in here largely due to the urban heat island effect that I've just shown you examples of? And virtually all experienced climatologists would say yes, it's just a degree of how much. But studies were done which claim to show that this curve has been corrected for the urban heat island effect. 
Two of the key studies were by Jones, who is a British at the Climate Research Centre in Britain, published in Nature, and his co-author uh, Wang, a Chinese gentleman, who published another paper in the same year in Geophysical Research Letters. These two papers said, and they are still relied upon today by the IPCC, the stations were selected on the basis of history. We chose those with few, if any, changes in instrumentation, location, or observation times. Well, they looked at 84 stations. For 49 of those, more than half, there is no historical record whatsoever. Nobody's got the faintest idea whether they've been moved or not, and most of them probably have. For the other 35 stations, uh, more than half of those have been moved two or three times. One of them has been moved five times. There is no possible way that the statement I read you just now, that they selected the stations which had the best history of not being mucked about to get their data from, could be true. Doug Keenan, a British statistician, was there for recently. The essential point here is the quoted statements cannot be true. They could not be in error by accident. The statements are fabricated. In other words, he is saying this is fraudulent research. This research underpins the whole IPCC case that urban heat island effect does not um, affect that graph. Well, that was seven scientific torpedoes. When you get really desperate, you turn to economics. Now, this gentleman, William Nordhaus, is a very distinguished scholar in Yale, uh, and he appears to believe that he can predict the costs to the world of global warming. He's, of course, wrong, but nonetheless, here's his estimate. He thinks it'll cost 22 trillion. And I'm giving you this in the context of two other gentlemen you've heard all about, which is Al Gore and, uh, uh, what's that, British fire? Um, Nicholas Stern, who have made the other estimates and told us we've got to stop the world to get off. Okay, so the cost of warming is 20 trillion. And whilst I think that's an absurd estimate, uh, nonetheless, everything that follows is internally consistent with that first figure. Stern's proposal for rapid deep cuts would save 15, uh, 13 billion and would actually cost 27 trillion, more than this. If you go to Al Gore's uh, proposal, you'll reduce the cost by 12 trillion, similar figure, but it'll cost you 34 trillion. <coughs> Both proposals imply carbon taxes rising to about $300 per tonne. You know what they are at the moment. They're around 30 in Europe in the next two decades, and six to $800 uh, dollars per tonne by 2030. $700 carbon tax would increase the price of coal-fired electricity in the US by 150% would impose a tax bill of $1.2 trillion on the US economy. This is torpedo number eight. This will not happen. You can't absorb torpedo after torpedo after torpedo without ultimately sinking. The astonishing thing is that I show you the figure of what should happen. What is actually happening is the Queen Mary, that is the IPCC, is continuing to stay and sail stately across the horizon, a side full of torpedo. There has never in human history been a greater disconnect between the basic science and what is going on at the moment in Sydney at APEC this year, a week, and is going to go on at United Nations conferences in Bali and New York. It is absolutely astonishing the disjunct between the politics and the socio-economics and the green agenda and the empirical mm -hmm. science. The assumption that prior to the Industrial Revolution the Earth had a stable climate is not even wrong. <coughs> Climate's always changed, it always will. There's nothing unusual about present day rates of change. Atmospheric CO2 is neither a pollutant nor is it the primary forcing agent for temperature change. In fact, carbon dioxide is a benefit for humankind. Try telling your teenage daughter that. <laughs> Attempting to stop climate change is an expensive act of utter futility. You might as well try and stop the clouds scudding across the sky. In fact, that's exactly what you're doing. The only sensible thing to do about climate change is to prepare for it. And the biggest scandal about the current global warming scam, and it is a scam, is that it's taking our attention away from the real climate change problem. There is a real climate change problem. There's a threat of cooling as well as warming. Cooling may well already have started in that levelling off of the temperature curve we've seen. The solar physicists are predicting we're going to have a phase of cooling. It's not even being discussed at the highest scientific and bureaucratic and political levels because of all the frenzy about imaginary global warming. Thank you very much.